Hello, and welcome to the Osterholm Update, COVID-19, a weekly podcast on the COVID-19 pandemic with Dr. Michael Osterholm. Dr. Osterholm is an internationally recognized medical detective and director of the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy, or CIDRAP, at the University of Minnesota. In this podcast, Dr. Osterholm will draw on more than 45 years of experience investigating infectious disease outbreaks to provide straight talk on the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm Chris Dahl, reporter for CIDRAP News, and I'm your host for these conversations. Mike, the U.S. has now passed 1 million cases of COVID-19 in over two months. What are your thoughts as we hit this unfortunate milestone? Well, I think one of the things that we've learned about this pandemic is that it's a slow, ever-moving, and never-forgiving kind of situation. Uh, The case numbers just keep getting bigger and bigger, even though we're not talking about necessarily any hot spots today in the United States in the way we were talking about them three or four weeks ago. We surely are seeing hot spots in other parts of the world. Ecuador right now appears to be leading the way that in that regard. And, you know, I think that as I do these podcasts, um, it becomes very easy just to become analytical and, you know, think about this as almost some kind of a blueprint for a business or a, you know, a machine. And this in every instance is about the people. It's the cases. Um, uh, I actually lost another friend this week uh, that I knew. Um, and so I think that that I hope every time we start these podcasts, we, we in a sense take a moment just to reflect on those more than 3 million people. And of course, the more than a million people now in the U.S. And as I'll come back to this later, um, these numbers will never get smaller. They're only going to get bigger and bigger. And uh, so as we dedicate ourselves, all of us listening to this podcast, that's something we must never, ever forget that each one of these was a loved one, that uh, big numbers surely sound big, but they're really, really small. And it's that one person you know that is part of that number that made a difference. And so in that sense, uh, yeah, it's been another, another week, another week. So let's start with your op-ed in today's New York Times, titled Let's Get Real About Coronavirus Tests, written with Mark Olshaker. For those who haven't read it, can you lay out some of the problems you addressed in that piece? Well, first of all, let me just say that uh, the motivation behind publishing this was, in fact, that uh, I fear that testing has become almost the equivalent of what we saw after 9-11, which people almost uh, worshipped Cipro as a way to get through that uh, terrible anthrax crisis. And in fact, I remember seeing people uh, with shirts on that said, in Cipro, we trust. Um, Testing is a very important tool, both for the individual patient, uh, for infection control purposes, for control, and for understanding where this particular pandemic is going. So make no mistake, testing is very important. But testing has become just about everything to anybody who wants somehow to impact on this pandemic. And I understand that. I I accept the fact that that, uh, when you don't have many tools, you'll take whatever tool you have and try to make it work. Uh, But at the same time, there are some real potential negative aspects to this uh, testing that we haven't really understood. So please make no mistake, testing is important. I'm a very strong testing advocate. But we have to make it work, and we have to make it work for all the right reasons. Nothing else, physics, and how that happens of to be kind of important in all of this. So the the uh, piece that Mark Olshaker and I did, really as a title, "Let's Get Real About Coronavirus Tests," was an attempt to say, take out time out right now. Everybody, slow down. We're making uh, judgment statements, making recommendations for plans that don't have a basis in reality. And that's not going to help us in the long run. So we really broke this down into four, uh, three different parts. Uh, we addressed, first of all, the tests themselves and what they uh, mean in terms of how they're run and how well do they work. And uh, when we looked at the, uh, for example, the PCR testing, uh, there have been almost 6 million such tests now performed in the United States, uh, according to the COVID tracking project. And uh, we're still way below what um, most other countries have run. Uh, but when we look at this issue, uh, it's clear to understand the reason we're not running tests is because we don't have reagents or we don't have the swabs. This is now for the PCR testing. 
And I wrote an op-ed piece in the New York Times with Mark Olshaker a month ago, saying in about three to four weeks, we were going to actually see a major challenge in trying to get testing done, as had been promised, because of the lack of reagents. Remind everyone, you've heard it already here on this program, that when Wuhan happened in December, the world was basically supplying reagents to these test kits and to those manufacturers at the level of a garden hose. Then when Wuhan happened and China lit up and there was a big increase in testing needs, the industry was basically able to expand to what I guess I would call a fire hose kind of uh, production. But that was about it. After that, the whole world lit up. Everybody needed these reagents. Everybody wanted to test. And at that point, we just outstripped the supply chain and manufacturing capacities for a lot of these reagents. So while today we surely have areas that have excess capacity at that particular point, but we also have many, many areas that have had challenges. Right here in Minnesota, I can attest to that. I uh, co-chair the governor's working group on testing in public health, and we have had a number of our testing laboratories unable to get the needed reagents they could have and should have had to increase testing. So the first thing we have to do is stop telling us to test 40 million people a week without any sense of reality. And one of the recommendations we made in here is that we really need a, a Marshall Plan where the federal government and the private sector get together and decide what are the challenges? What can we do to quickly boost these reagents? What can we do to uh, uh, actually increase the potential uh, reagent pool? Don't get into a debate of how many more tests we have this week. Let's come up with a number that we need. What's it going to take to get us there? And then let's just do it. Let's just find a collaborative way to bring everyone together. So that really was our, our first uh, message. And uh, we provided some information to support that as, as, as the challenge. The second thing we raised is just how well do these tests work? Now, you think of a laboratory test as being quite good, but they frankly can be a mix from not so good to pretty good to actually quite good. None of these tests by themselves are perfect. Understand that. No one would expect them to be. But for example, most people don't realize, even with PCR testing, this polymerase chain reaction, what we're doing is we're extracting the sample out of the swab. We're then extracting the RNA out of the virus if it's there. If it's not there, of course, we're not extracting anything out. That RNA is then converted DNA uh, through, again, reagents and chemicals. And then it's presented to an, uh, basically a machine that amplifies it and continues to basically cycle it to get more and more and more and more and more and more DNA Tell any one of 28, 30, 35 cycles, you'll know if there's positive DNA there. If it's not, then that meant there never was RNA there. That's PCR. Well, even though it sounds very precise and most sophisticated, which it is, we know that a recent study from the Cleveland Clinic found that five commonly used diagnostic PCR tests for this had almost 15% of the results were false negatives, meaning 15% of the time you'd tell someone with that test, you were not infected, you don't have it, even though you did. And then a study from Chinese scientists published in February found that the false negative rate of some of their tests conducted at the Third People's Hospital in Sichuan had almost a 40% false negative rate, meaning that they missed four out of every 10 people as being positive. Now, today, we're actually bringing in a number of these tests from China. And already we've seen discussions of countries in Europe, uh, countries in South America that have turned them back in. India just did today, uh, turned back uh, on million tests because of the problems with these uh, poor outcomes. that They weren't very well done. So the really important message is we have to figure out how these tests work and what we can do about them to make them work better. And if we have tests that are not working, then we have to basically uh, not use those. So we surely have to get these tests to be uh, operating at the highest levels of sensitivity and specificity that we can. But let me also just point out the problems, even if they're really running well compared to what we would hope and expect. When you use these tests in very low prevalence situations, meaning something's only infrequently there, in our world of epidemiology, that's less than 20 or 30 percent. These tests operate very differently in terms of the proportion of, of the positives they pick up as real positives and those they pick up 
and the, what we call false positives as true positives. For example, if you have a test today, an antibody test, that is 95% specific and 95% sensitive, meaning that 95% of the time it will pick up the false uh, negatives uh, correctly. A hundred, And then if you look at the issue with the sensitivity, it will pick up the real true positives 95% of the time. Let's just take a theoretical population of 1 million people. If you have a 5% prevalence of something such as antibody in that population, that would be 50,000 out of a million. If I tested that with this approved test, which has very high sensitivity and specificity, I would pick up 47,500 of the, the 50,000 as true positive, a pretty good showing. I still miss 2,500 and tell them that they were not infected when in fact they were. But more concerning in a way is that I would pick up 47,500 as false positives, the very same number of true positives. That's what happens with these tests. And so imagine today trying to tell somebody in a work setting, like a hospital, hoping that in fact these antibodies mean that you're protected against reinfection. I'm telling a doctor or a nurse, by the way, you're positive. This is good. On the other hand, you have a one out of two chance it's not real. How is that test going to be interpreted? How, how, how is that going to come across to people saying, why are you doing this? And we have had none of that discussion. Instead, we keep saying we're going to test our way out of this. We have to test, test, test. And people don't understand what the implications for this happen to be. So where are we at now? Well, the FDA clearly has to clean this mess up in a certain way. And when I say mess, this is what I mean, is that after the CDC uh, had its challenges with getting the test methods out earlier this winter, um, we all clamored for some more testing. The FDA acting on this, and I would say under some political pressure, literally opened the floodgates at FDA for approval, or in this case, just an ability to make it available, tests that should never have made it to the market. Right now, under the emergency provisions that FDA has, there are over 61 PCR tests that have been brought forward, of which some of these are the very tests I just talked about. In addition, there's 136 unvetted uh, antibody tests, where all you had to do is come in and say, you've met a minimum standard in your lab to pick up antibody, uh, and, and you can now go ahead and use this uh, uh, in public and private labs around the uh, world. And this is uh, crazy that we would just let this happen like this without any understanding to what it means in terms of real results. I've likened this to the wild, wild west. And so if I'm a clinician or a laboratorian and I don't know this, and I'm ordering these tests with one of these test kits that turns out to be what has been defined by one senior FDA official, in a conversation with a number of lab directors as crap, you know, then we have to know that that's not the kind of testing we want or need. So in terms of this op-ed piece, we were just calling for that too, that the FDA has to make this a high priority to get in and clean this up. They need to review carefully all of these tests, uh, however they have been brought forward, and uh, make sure that we have educated the uh, medical community, the laboratory community, what the sensitivities and specificities of the test really are, and then how do we move forward with that? So we're hopeful that we can contribute to a better testing environment uh, over time, both in terms of the amount of testing and the kind of testing that gets done and, and provides us with the kind of results that we're looking for. So, Mike, let, let's talk about the issue of antibody testing and, and how it relates to immunity, uh, because we've received a few emails on this topic, and, and the World Health Organization recently addressed it. Uh, in short, what evidence is there that an infection with the novel coronavirus confers immunity going forward? Well, let's separate this to, to some component pieces. I think that'll help. First of all, uh, the concept of immunity is critical not just in terms of somebody recovering from their illness, which they do, suggesting there's surely something going on in the immune system that plays a positive role, but also are they protected against reinfection down the road? And that is what uh, came up this past week when the WHO put out a statement basically saying that there were no data in humans to support that immunity existed in, in any manner. And technically they were correct, but unfortunately it came across, I think, as uh, a statement that uh, was half empty, half full kind of message without giving the reasons why. 
what they should have said is that to date, there haven't been any studies that have looked at this, none that refuted it, uh, that there might be some immunity, but also none that supported it. And uh, so from that perspective, uh, we still have an open verdict on that. And I think that uh, that is fair. That's very fair to say we still have a lot to understand about immunity with coronavirus infections. I surely don't pretend to be a coronavirus expert, particularly from the immunologic standpoint. Uh, but in talking to colleagues in this area, if you look at what happened with SARS and MERS and the waning immunity over time, uh, there are very well may be some real challenges to having long-term immunity with uh, this infectious agent. And we just don't know yet. But I think also we have to look at what data do we have on the short term in terms of animal models. Uh, there have been several studies published recently that uh, uh, two from China, one where they took macaque monkeys and challenged them with uh, uh, COVID-19 virus. And uh, then they came back and, and re-challenged them after they had fully recovered. And all of them were protected. They didn't get infected the second challenge. In addition, there's been at least one vaccine study, a very limited study done in China, where similarly, they actually vaccinated uh, these monkeys with a medium dose and a high dose, and then came back and challenged them. And uh, all the high dose ones were completely protected, not only just from illness, but also no evidence of viremia. The virus didn't circulate in the blood. And the low dose group didn't get sick, but they did have transient viremia, or the presence of the virus in the blood again, supporting the idea that there is some protection. Uh, more recently, we heard about uh, the vaccine for human use that's coming from Oxford University in England, actually was tested at the Rocky Mountain uh, Lab of the NIH here in the United States by Vincent Munster and colleagues. And they found that there in fact was immunity in these similar macaques uh, that uh, after they had been vaccinated. So I think the question is not whether there is immunity, it's how long does it last and how good is it? And that, I think, is still a very much an open question. I would feel, uh, let's put it this way, the weight of the world on all of our shoulders if we found out that this immunity was only very short-lived and didn't protect us against reinfection eventually, uh, which at that point would mean that we're in, much, uh, we're in a much more hell of a mess than any of us could have imagined in terms of where do we go long-term with vaccine, where do we go with uh, the idea of developing herd immunity. On the other hand, I think we have to be careful not to say that that can't be there. We don't know that yet. And uh, this is, to me, one of the most important issues right now confronting us in this whole pandemic. We've got to better understand immunity. That was what will drive uh, whether or not we develop herd immunity and, and actually see this virus slow down. It'll give us the information. Can we get a vaccine that's effective? Will it, will it work for months? Will it work for years? And uh, so I, I can't say more strongly how important it is that we get much more information on this area. And I know that there are groups that are studying this, and uh, we look forward to that information as soon as possible. So, Mike, well, one of the ideas that the WHO addressed in their statement was the idea of immunity passports. Um, what do you make of that idea? Because that, that has been mentioned by several countries of issuing people immunity passports if they are producing antibodies. This is actually one of those examples I was just referring to where there are well-intended people who mean to help provide a better way of understanding who's protected, who's not, who might be infected, who might get infected by creating these immunity passports, but they have no sense at all of what they really mean or what we can say about this level of antibody and what it means in terms of protection. So this is far, far uh, too uh, early in the game to decide that we can do that. Um, I also worry about companies I see right now that are talking about reopening when they are actually wanting to test their workers to see if they're antibody positive or not. And this would be a way that they can get reopened sooner. Uh, not true. And uh, so I think immunity passports need to be put on the shelf for some time yet to come. And uh, uh, they provide no uh, benefit from a public health standpoint or for that matter for the individual because it's very possible that uh, the information is, is wrong in terms of are they antibody positive or not with real antibody? And number two, what does that antibody mean? Over the past few weeks, there have been several COVID-19 outbreaks in U.S. meatpacking plants, uh, several here in the Midwest. Uh, at least 18 plants have been closed. Uh, how concerned are you about the impact of COVID-19 on the food supply chain? And, and can these plants be operated safely without putting workers at risk? 
Well, this is clearly one of the uh, serious collateral damage issues in terms of, of industry that uh, hadn't well had been well anticipated at all. Um, what we have here is, as you pointed out, the number of processing plants, and in fact, on, on data that we now have uh, seen from the Food and Environment Reporting Network, this is an investigative nonprofit. Uh, they they are mapping COVID nineteen cases in food and meat processing plants, and today they announced that, in fact, that they have identified in eighty five meat packing and processed food plants with at least one confirmed COVID case. And at least 16 of the meatpacking plants, as you just mentioned, and five processed food plants are currently closed. They also estimated that at least 4,330 workers are confirmed to be sick who work in those plants, and at least 19 have died. Now, we have to, at the first instance, say that we can't always attribute all these cases to the workplace. Uh, many of these people will otherwise congregate outside of work. Uh, we know that's true with healthcare workers, or we surely have some who, uh, in potentially a sizable number of people who acquired it at work, but some who actually acquired it outside the work setting. But I think in this case, the reasons why we're seeing such an increased occurrence of cases is by the very nature of the crowded work areas that these people occupy. Um, if you've ever seen meatpacking, if you've ever seen the processing of, of uh, poultry, pork, or beef, you know that they're basically elbow to elbow in many cases working in very tight spaces. Um, the challenge I think I have here is that um, these workers, in many instances, have no other work uh, opportunities in these smaller communities where these plants are at if they're not working at the plant. And uh, it's not as simple as saying, this is unsafe, I'm going to leave and go somewhere else. At the same time, there's no plant that wants this to happen. They want to do what is the right thing to do uh, to minimize the, the problem. And, and I think the challenge we have is, so what's the right advice? And this is one where I know that I'm not uh, in the mainstream of many people's idea on this, but I really believe that uh, uh, we're not providing adequate respiratory protection to these people with surgical masks. Um, we just have too much data that has been accumulated. It's clear and compelling to me and many others that aerosols play a, an important role in the transmission of this virus. Aerosols are those things that float in the air. They occur just by breathing. They occur just by talking and a surgical mask will not stop them from escaping from you, and they won't stop them from coming into you. And so uh, I surely believe that N95s have to be prioritized for healthcare workers. But at the same time, anytime you have a work setting where you have people working this closely together, they need to have this kind of respiratory protection. I, I can't emphasize that enough. On the other hand, people say, well, we'll just clean up, you know, more uh, environmental cleaning. I have said this on this program before. I will continue to say it. we have overstated by some long shot just how much transmission occurs with the environment. Not that I'd be happy to admit that. If you look at the data very closely, uh, it's, it's almost to me something that is uh, there as, as a means because it's something we can do something about, i.e. wash our hands, wash the surfaces. But, but uh, so in these, in these meatpacking operations, uh, you know, I don't think it's a function of there's just gross contamination of this virus on all kinds of surfaces. It's in the air. And until we really get a uh, an airborne control program in place in these settings, I think we're going to continue to see transmission. I don't think it's going to stop there. I think there are going to be other areas of close conjugate working, meaning they're all together, that we're going to see the same thing. Ventilation can help by increasing the airflow in these operations. Um, in many instances, that's already happening. So this is one of those terribly, terribly unfortunate collateral damage issues where um, it's just we don't have easy and good answers. I think that the local and state public health agencies that have gone in and there, uh, into these plants, working with the plant owners, the plant operators, in many instances, they have been, you know, they themselves have been forthcoming about what can we do. Um, it, it's just a real challenge. Now, where this hurts us, of course, is not just the fact that that uh, this is a problem in the plants, uh, although I would say that, uh, you know, getting sick and dying is probably the ultimate uh, that all these things we're talking about. But at the same time, we're talking about the livelihood of many people who farm, people who are raising hogs, who are raising beef, who are raising uh, chickens to lay eggs that now can't sell because the plants that process them are shut down and you actually have a very specific supply chain 
of these animals or the eggs coming in. And if the plant's down, you just can't hold them because they're going to keep coming up from the bottom in. You remember you started raising new pigs yesterday, and even though the ones that are ready to go to market right now uh, don't have a place to go, you're going to have to do something about them. And that's where, unfortunately, we've seen these terrible situations where we've had to put these animals down uh, because there's no place for them to go. So I think that this is going to be one of those ones where we'll go back and look at uh, what can we do. Now, the CDC did just issue guidance on this area. Um, and I think that that's helpful. Although, again, I come back to respiratory protection. I am more convinced now than ever that's what is needed. And until we have uh, N95 level protection in these facilities, we're going to continue to see transmission. Um, I don't have an answer for that because I also, at the same time, desperately want to protect our healthcare workers with N95s. So I think we need to, to come up with something. I have, uh, for some time, uh, believed in my heart of hearts that the ultimate miracle would be is if somebody could come along and make a, a washable, everyday washable N95 that maintained its uh, total uh, uh, capacity to filter out viruses that uh, could be reused over and over again, and everyone could have one. Um, if we had that, that would be a great step forward, but we don't right now. And so what we're going to have to do is continue to work on respiratory protection in these facilities and know that uh, uh, we're far from done in terms of dealing with these. The CDC has issued new guidance on COVID-19 in pets, recommending that people who are infected restrict interaction with their pets. How concerned should people be about their pets getting sick? Well, the first and most important thing is don't overreact to this. <laughs> I, I've heard more people who uh, have been anguished by the fact that they may have to give up their pet because of the situation. And uh, that is not all at all the case. There clearly is increasing evidence that in the close context of being around a case, you know, a, an owner uh, being close to an, an animal, or even in the case of the tigers in the zoo in New York, um, where an infected worker was around these tigers that became infected, that we do know that dogs and cats have been able to get infected. We know that also, I mean, we're using monkeys and ferrets to infect uh, these animals with these viruses. So the question is, what role do they play? Um, and what CDC has tried to do, I think, is balance that by saying, don't do anything different yet except. Just try to separate your pets if you can and you're out walking while it may be circulating uh, in our communities. Maybe there are some pets that are infected with this. Uh, if you're infected, don't care for your pet at that point. Get someone else to do it just so that you make sure you don't infect the pet, who then might very well end up infecting someone else uh, although we have no data, and I want to remind you that we have no data that says that animals have infected a human, uh, other than, of course, the original jump, you might say. So at this point, this is one of those state tuned situations. Uh, I wouldn't do anything yet uh, that is any different than loving your pet and letting your pet love you. Uh, I think as how we handle animals uh, at an agricultural level, we're going to need to look at uh, if we're, in fact, having sick uh, of workers on farms, does that mean that they may expose the animals to the virus? I'm convinced if it's going to transmit, it's likely going to be people, animals, not the other way around initially. So uh, until we really uh, get more information on this, I wouldn't do anything different. I, again, am convinced that it's not a major issue in terms of human transmission. The Washington Post and the University of Maryland came out with a poll today uh, showing significant support for social distancing measures among Americans. Uh, Mike, were you, were you surprised by these results? Well, I understand that there are those who are suffering not from the virus itself, but from the uh, lockdown, uh, this distancing we put in place uh, on a number of, of companies and organizations uh, over the course of the past month and a half. This has been tough. It's been really tough. Uh, although there is federal support coming uh, to these people, they all still are very desperately worried about their jobs, their future, the debt they owe, how they're going to make rent, etc. And so I think it also though points out that these people are concerned clearly about what's happening and how we're trying to control this situation. And I was actually somewhat uh, uh, pleased to see the data as I saw it come out. Now, this was a poll. Uh, that uh, surveyed 1,008 adults around the country. Um, and it had a very, very good design to it. 
And basically, in short, what they said was, these are plus or minus 3% estimates, that uh, uh, if you look at the restrictions on restaurants, stores, and other businesses, that they felt that about 66% of the, of the survey um, uh, participants believed that it was just right, what was going on, it was appropriate. Uh, 17% said it was too restrictive, and ironically, an equal number of 16% said it wasn't restrictive enough. So the American public, on a whole, still gets the issue that we're dealing with here and how important it was. When they look at the size of uh, uh, current restrictions and the size of, of public gatherings, uh, a measure that many of us uh, miss desperately going to our concerts or going to eat, et cetera, uh, 64% said they thought that what was happening was appropriate, that 14% thought it was too restrictive, and an additional 22% thought it was not restrictive enough. So if you add those up, we're in the high 80s uh, for both uh, the issue of whether or not uh, the restrictions on restaurants, uh, stores, and businesses has been appropriate or large gatherings and meetings. Um, in terms of, of how it breaks down politically, it was uh, uh, of interest that 72% uh, of Democrats, 62% of Republicans, and 66% of uh, independents said yes, that in fact we needed to have these lack of this kind of distancing going on. Uh, for an overall average of 66%. So I think that also shows that there is wide base support for this. And I think governors have feeling, been feeling that as well as feeling some of the heat. So I think in a whole, uh, this won't continue. Uh, if people feel like the disease is in a sense going away, as I just mentioned, I think then there'll be more and more people concerned about this. And this is where we really have to get down this accelerator break action, where if we see potential transmission increasing, how do we put the brake on it as quickly as possible and as effectively as possible with doing the least amount of harm to our economy, uh, to the society as we know it, but at the same time not letting this get out of control. And uh, this will be our real challenge. I continue to push, and we'll be coming out with another paper on that about threading that rope to the needle. How do we work to the middle? Not in lockdown, not just willy-nilly transmission, but how do we get people back into society with the lowest risk possible of having a severe case of illness or a death. And I think that's our challenge going forward. But I, again, I'm heartened by the data here uh, that Americans see why this is important and they're largely supported. Uh, any parting thoughts, Mike? Yeah, well, again, thank you for listening. Um, you know, to try to be more responsive to all of you out there that we've heard from, um, we've decided to start a new uh, part of the of the podcast each week, that is to answer your questions. And what I will do is uh, every week we'll take a question from a listener uh, that's been submitted and uh, try to do the best I can to answer it for you. Um, they can be submitted to OsterholmUpdate at gmail.com. And I'll select a question every week and uh, try to answer it. The other thing I just wanted to say is that um, as I did last week, I talked about the concern that I have about the growing schism in this country, and for that matter, around the world with this disease. And I think it deserves coming back to every week to remind people that's the one thing we don't want to do. Um, I can tell you that this week I probably received more, for lack of a better term, hate mail, which I forwarded on to the uh, University of Minnesota Police Department. Um, and I'm not alone. I know there's a number of people that are starting to get this. And I think that that's a very, very, very small minority of the population. But I think it's really important that people understand that now is the time for us, uh, more than ever, we may have differences in a number of different issues, uh, but that we really need to come together on this thing. The other piece I would just say in parting is the fact that I anticipate, I hope, and again, hope is not a strategy, I hope that over the course of the next um, few weeks to, to months, we're going to actually see a, a substantial reduction in transmission. Uh, I just have a sense that this is actually going to come down. Uh, and if it does, it, it shouldn't be interpreted as we've won or that somehow we're in control. Um, later this week, we'll be coming out with our first document of a series of SIDRAP papers. Uh, this one will actually address the issue of what we might expect over the course of the next 16 to 20 months, not modeling as such, but rather uh, what was likely to occur between now and then to get us closer to that 60 to 70% uh, prevalence rate 
uh, that, that really critical level for us to actually see herd immunity develop. How might those cases all look between now and then? And so next week, I'll be discussing that on the show. Um, and in the meantime, I hope that the case numbers continue to decrease over time. Uh, but I'm also very, very aware that they're coming back, and we just have to remember that. Last but not least, I just want to thank the crew here who uh, helped put this podcast on and helped keep an old man like me straight in the facts. Uh, and it starts right at the top with uh, Chris Dahl, who is the uh, MC here and, and uh, wonderful SIDREP uh, news reporter, Maya Peters, who's engineer par excellence, and uh, Corey Anderson and uh, Angie Ulrich, who helped. Uh, educate me about the factual basis of what I hopefully say uh, as, as they would want me to say it. So I just wanted to thank them. And I wish you all have a good week and uh, spring is coming. Uh, we need it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Osterholm. And thanks for listening to the Osterholm Update, COVID-19, a weekly podcast from the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy. We'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, you can keep up with the latest COVID-19 news by visiting our website, sidrap.umn.edu. Hey, everyone. Just a reminder that if you'd like to submit a question for the podcast, you can email us at osterholmeupdate at gmail.com. And if you appreciate Dr. Ostrom's straight talk and the work of Sidrap, please consider contributing to our crowdfunding campaign. You can find that information in the episode description.